Luke chapter 23, beginning of verse 39. It is written, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Good evening. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank the elders for allowing me this opportunity to present to you a lesson from God's word, and I would like to thank you all as well for your presence here tonight. And if you're visiting with us this evening, and we're looking forward to hearing a lesson from Brent, or perhaps from our preacher trainee Sam, I can tell you that what I lack in their experience, knowledge, and skill, I try to make up for that with 10-minute sermons. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I am very thankful for this opportunity, and I am looking forward to hearing Bryce's lesson in a few moments as well. The reading that Dennis just did for us is one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. And I find it interesting that in all four of the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, the only time that we see the dialogue between Jesus and the two thieves is here in Luke chapter 23. When I think about this, I think about a comment that Pete made in our Sunday morning Bible class here a few months ago. He said, God doesn't waste ink. And I had never heard that before, and it really stuck with me. And the more I thought about that, I realized that there's a reason for every word in the Bible. There's an application that we can make from every passage. And so tonight, I would like to share with you the lesson that I take from these five verses in Luke. To start, I want to examine the similarities between these two thieves. We know that both of these men were guilty. And I think it's safe to say that since they are from that area and since they both spoke of Christ's reputation, they knew who Jesus was and who he proclaimed to be. They knew that they were not long for this world, and lastly, they knew that while looking at Christ, they had to make a choice. Now I want to look at the similarities between these two thieves and ourselves. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we know that we too are guilty, not of the laws of this world, I hope, but of sin. We all know who Jesus is, who he proclaimed to be, and his teachings. I think it's safe to say the majority of the world knows as well. We know that we are living on borrowed time and that our lives here on this earth are but a vapor. And lastly, when it comes to Christ, we all have to make a choice. So what choice did the first thief make? We see his choices in Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Here we see that the thief's first choice was to blaspheme Christ. In the verses leading up to this account, we see that the thief was not the first to mock Christ. We see in verse 35 that the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And in verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Sadly, this thief was only following the crowds. Today, we need to be wary of following the crowds. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul warns us of this by saying, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The world will blaspheme and mock God, but we cannot conform since we are not of this world. The second choice that this thief makes is to ask Christ to be saved. But the problem here is not that the thief asked to be saved, it's the manner in which he asked and the type of salvation that he was asking for. This thief doesn't just ask Jesus to be saved, he challenges him. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. How often do we see this viewpoint in our culture today? People asking God for a sign. 
almost as if they are bargaining with him. Just show me a sign, and I'll believe. And this wasn't different in Jesus' day either. In Mark chapter 8, and in verses 11 through 12, it says, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, that is Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Sadly, for some in this world, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is not enough. His written word isn't enough. It is easier for them to ignore God's word and to say that God never showed me a sign than to realize that his word is the only sign we need. So we can see that this thief challenged Jesus to save him. But from what? This thief wanted a physical salvation. He wanted instant gratification and for his life on this earth to be saved. He wasn't calling on Christ for spiritual deliverance, but for a situational deliverance. Unfortunately, he failed to recognize his spiritual death sentence. In John chapter 8, starting in verse 21, Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees in the temple, says, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, because he says, Where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This thief mocked Jesus. He challenged him. He failed to recognize who Christ was. He made his choices, and he had to face the consequences. But now I want us to look at the other thief. If you go back to Luke chapter 3, or excuse me, Luke chapter 23, and starting in verse 40, there it is written, But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The first choice that this thief makes is to answer the other thief and to rebuke him. He saw that the other thief was openly blaspheming Christ, and he had the courage and the compassion to confront him. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? We live in a world that is full of sinful attitudes, and though it might be difficult to do at times, we need to answer these people, but we must do it from a compassionate heart. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, Paul prepares Timothy for this task. In verse 1, he writes to Timothy, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The second choice this thief makes is to understand and to recognize his own guilt and the innocence of Jesus. The religious leaders of the day had had Jesus crucified, but this thief, this criminal, recognized that Jesus was an innocent man. Barabbas had just been set free instead of Jesus. Perhaps this thief knew that Barabbas was guilty and deserving of crucifixion, but he was set free, and Jesus took his place. When I think about this, I start to realize that I am Barabbas. Jesus didn't sin and fall short of the glory of God. I did. We all did. But still, 
Jesus took our place. In Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6, Paul lays this out for us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In humility, this thief recognized his own guilt in light of Jesus' innocence. I don't know if the first thief recognized his own guilt or not, but he didn't humbly accept it. He wanted to be released from the consequences of his actions, but not the second thief. He didn't ask to be released from his situation because he saw the greater need. And in seeing that greater need, the thief made his final choice. He chose to call upon Jesus, not for physical salvation, but for spiritual salvation. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus gave his life on the cross so that we, like these thieves, would have a choice. So what choices are we making? Are we mocking and blaspheming Christ, or are we rebuking those who do so? Are we challenging Jesus, or are we recognizing that he is the Son of God? And lastly, are we seeking salvation, not in this world, but from this world? So in closing, I want us all individually to ask ourselves this question. If our lives on this earth were to come to an end tonight, And if we were to stand before Jesus in judgment, would he be able to look at you and at me and tell us, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you. If you would like to mark your song books at this time, it's song number 326, song number 326, Trust and Obey. And we'll sing the first, second, and last verses at the appropriate time. <laughs> 